What's going on, everybody? Jackson Fuller here, and you are listening to the latest episode of Hog and the Mic. It is Monday, May 6th. Going to bring in Hutch and uh, have our normal podcast with some cheesy rock music intro. Sorry about any audio difficulties last week. Uh, I've got the the laptop back, and we're up and rolling uh, back to normal. But one thing that's not normal is the Arkansas baseball performance this weekend. Just for the second time all season, they lose a uh, weekend series. Um, they dropped two out of three games to Kentucky. Hutch and I will discuss all of that and a couple of big time, uh, basketball commits through the transfer portal, which happened early in the week, but we did not get to discuss on the last hog in the mic podcast. So keep it right here. We'll bring Hutch in and get this episode rolling. Hutch, how's it going, man? Uh, you know, the, what's, how is the weekend, uh, a baseball team away, but some concerns have to be arising, I think for any, uh, Arkansas media or fan member who, uh, you know, either is cheering for the team or wants the team to do well for better business. Uh, you know, how, how was the weekend and uh, what maybe some first, let's dive in right away, some overall impressions from Arkansas baseball's performance in Lexington this weekend. Well, I have to say, uh, I kind of predicted this, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I was on uh, another podcast, uh, the Southeastern 14, uh, uh, real good friends with uh, Chris over there. He does a good job. And he asked me for my prediction for this weekend. And I said, you know, I could totally see, I'm, I think I'm going to pick them to lose this series. I, I could easily see them winning game one and then dropping the next two games. And lo and behold, that's kind of what happened. And that's just kind of, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily been a trend. Cause I mean, it's, it's happened twice. Um, but you know, the road games have been a little bit tricky. Um, and uh, for that, to you know, kind of unfold in a similar fashion it was not surprising, especially being against a, a top ten team that's now leading the SEC in Kentucky. So uh, it was kind of it, a lot of the same things that have been kind of in the background as as potential issues kind of came to a head, and then it resulted in them losing two out of three. Funny, uh, I also had an interview with the SEC 14 this week, but it was with Chase uh, to talk a little Arkansas football. So uh, if he would have asked for my prediction, I would have been wrong. I definitely thought the Hogs would win game one. I thought they would steal a second game on the road and take the series. Um, but the pitching just let them down this weekend, I think, which is, you know, it feels a little harsh because the hitting also not great over the final two games. Um and I think you're starting to see a, a very concerning trend with the series finale. Um, this is back-to-back -back weeks. I just don't think the hitting has been good enough against uh, a Sunday game three type pitching staff. Now, you know, Jack Caglione pitched last, you know, he's been pretty good last week for Florida. He's been pretty good all season. He pitched last week for Florida um, in the series finale. But still, I mean, he's gotten hit big a couple times the Florida bullpen uh you know when they turned to them they did it did good enough against Arkansas um the bats just aren't taking advantage of some of the weaker pitching right now and uh I think that's a concern but I really don't think it's the biggest concern coming out of this week and I do think it's that starting pitching duo of Brady Tiger and Mason Molina just because you know I don't think either guy has been as consistent as Arkansas, the, the coaching staff and the fans envision this year. Um, Brady had a couple really good performances coming into the weekend and then kind of went back to where he was early in the SEC. Uh, what have you seen from both of those guys? Um, I guess, do you think a pitching change could be on the horizon? Uh, Dave's talked about Gage Wood coming for somebody's job. I find that hard to believe at this point of the season that he's going to make a change to the weekend rotation. But what do you, what do you think, Hutch? Well, Dave came out and said it. And generally speaking, he doesn't just, you know, BS us. Like, you know, you see a lot of football coaches do a lot. Um, generally he says what he means. Now, will he actually go through with it? We'll, we'll see. Um, but Gage Wood, I thought did look really good. Uh, you know, in, in his four and a third, I know he, ended up being charged with three runs, but he, he pitched a lot better than that final stat line maybe indicates. And, and they, they've said that, you know, they've been trying to ramp him up. You know, they threw him, you know, three innings midweek, then they threw him up you know, close to 80 pitches uh, against Kentucky. So I think it's coming. And, and I think Dave is just kind of fed up with the way that the season's gone for, for Brady and Mason, uh, especially Molina has struggled with the walks. I mean, this is something I've been writing about since the fall. Like, you know, this guy is, is, 
almost unhittable when he's around the strike zone. Uh, but if he's not, he's putting people on. And then if you make a mistake, then, you know, suddenly it's, it's, you're, you're in trouble. Um, you know, I know he ended up only giving up three runs, but it could have been a lot worse. Um, Tiger, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit the same thing, you know, he doesn't maybe walk as many, but he also hits a bunch of people. I think he, I haven't checked to see what the the stats are after this weekend, but I think he may still be leading the SEC and hit by pitches. Um, probably not a stat you want to be leading in. Uh, when you combine hit by pitches and walks, him and Molina are pretty similar in terms of their, you know, free passes per nine innings. Uh, very similar numbers. It was crazy. Whenever Dave came out and said that Gage Wood's taking somebody's job, a lot of people on social media were like, oh, well, it's obviously Brady. Like he he's it's obvious. I'm like, is it though? Is it because both of them have very very similar numbers? They both kind of struggled. Brady had at least shown capable. You know, he he put together back to back quality starts before this weekend. Now this weekend was not good. Don't get me wrong. Could have been a lot different if a play was made in left field. That in my opinion should have been made. Um, and who knows how it goes differently from there, but. But Brady has been the better pitcher of late than Mason Molina, which is crazy because Mason was this, I mean, highly, highly touted transfer, was going to be a guy that, that gave him a, another ace in the in the uh, rotation. And it just kind of hasn't really come to fruition. He started out really, really strong, uh, but has not gone well of late. You know, he missed the floor start because of an injury, but before that he issued seven walks in South Carolina. I don't know, man. It's just... I could see a rotation change coming, uh, you know, if, if, if Dave, Dave really wants to follow through with it, you know, it'd be good, good time to do it. You know, if, with Mississippi state coming to town, at least get to do it at home and see what Gage Wood's made of. But, uh, I, I would not be surprised if a change is made. Here's, here's what I think is most working in Gage Wood's favor is he has six walks on the season, uh, in 25 and two thirds innings. So, Whereas uh, Brady and Molina both have more than 30 and now they've pitched a lot more innings, but they've, you know, they're averaging pretty much a walk every other inning. Um, well, more, excuse me, like 1.5, 1.3 walks every, every in or every, my math is just terrible right now. A little <laughs> under one walk an inning, whereas Gage is way under that mark. So I think if, if, if there is going to be a change, I think like you hit the nail on the head, it's because of the walks. It's because of the lack of control. Um, Brady and Mason, when they've gotten themselves into trouble this year, they've put themselves into trouble. It's not like a lot of teams have strung together like three, four hits in an inning, um, which we can't really say about Will McIntyre. I mean, that's kind of been the basis of his struggles. It, um, but I do think, I, I think it's interesting that, See, I read it differently, and I guess we'll have to just disagree, and we won't really find out until Dave, uh, you know, announces a weekend rotation. But when he said Gage is coming for somebody's job, like, I mean, there's still a, there's still a barrier I felt like between Gage and the weekend starters because he he wasn't really a midweek starter just yet. Like he start, I know he started the most recent game against Missouri State, but I would think between him and Ben Bybee, Ben Bybee is still higher on the pecking order in terms of starting pitching. Um, now, maybe, maybe Dave, maybe Dave is just, you know, he's that fed up. It's like, all right, enough. Like we're elevating Gage Wood, you know, a couple spots and into the weekend rotation. But I felt like Gage was so far down on the bullpen and starting pitching pecking order before this week against Missouri State that he just meant is he's coming for some guy's jobs in some more high leverage spots. Like maybe a Will McIntyre, honestly. I mean, I, I, I got to say, I was, I was stunned that Will McIntyre got the ball in the fourth inning against Kentucky. I know he pitched, you know, better against Missouri State and better against Kentucky on Friday, on the, his Friday night appearance. Um, but, I mean, he, he had a walk and he gave up a hit against uh, Kentucky. And, I, like, I know hit was scoreless, but I didn't feel like he was – terrific out there he got mad at himself a few times for missing spots and getting ahead I still felt like there was just I was a little off still and look it was three nothing in the fourth inning that game was still right there I I felt like it should have been Gackle or uh or Fouch you know maybe even Dossett just you know let's let's wait and you know if we have to bring in McIntyre but Dave had all the confidence in the world in him 
the decision didn't end up working. And I felt, I feel like maybe that's more of the type of job that, that Gage could be coming for. Um, I don't know. Well, Dave's not going to answer that question today at Swatters Club. He's not going to answer that question, you know, any time until he absolutely has to when, you know, he it's time to name a weekend rotation. And even then he might go TBA uh, heading into the weekend. But we'll see. I think I think Brady deserves 100 percent another round in the rotation. Um, like you said, if Ross Lovich makes that play in left field, I think his start is completely different um, than what it was. And I, you know, Mason it just feels like there's a very short leash there. Like it's not terrible, but Dave is clearly frustrated with the inconsistency and the wildness. And if that leash keeps getting shorter, then yeah, I guess Gage, I, I do think Gage Wood has been more impressive than Ben Bybee in recent weeks. Maybe he could jump both of those guys and get into the weekend rotation. Yeah, see, I had the same thought that maybe he was going to steal someone's job like in the bullpen. It's like I tried to ask Dave that follow-up question. Like, hey, are you are you talking about like as a starter or like a, like a long release? Like somebody – in the bullpen and he was like well he's already you know a long reliever he's already a bullpen guy like he's gonna start and I think they see him as a starter in the future like maybe next year um you know kind of like you know Brady Tiger you know they always had him in the bullpen he was a high leverage guy but they always knew in the end that they wanted him to be a starter and so they you know they finally did move him in the starter you know late last year as he came back from his injury now this is obviously a different situation Gage hasn't been hurt but Maybe it's something like that where, like, okay, we're just going to go ahead and get a look at what you can do. And, you know, maybe if it, it goes well, then great. If it doesn't, maybe that's the, you know, kick in the butt that, that Mason Molina needs to, to get, you know, get back on track. You know, who knows kind of how he plays his cards uh, with that. And, and honestly, the other thing, too, is, like, when it comes to, uh, you know, which guy, you know, he would replace in the rotation, like, my my question is I wonder – they know what Brady, they know what Tiger can do out of the bullpen. So maybe they could, you know, start Gage and have Tiger come out of the bullpen because he's done it before. Molina, he's pretty much been a starter. I'd have to go back and look what he did his freshman year at Texas Tech. I think he did come out of the bullpen some then, but you know, maybe it could be a situation where you let Molina go and if if he's on, you let him go for five innings or whatever. If he's not, you have a quick hook and you go to Gage where they kind of piggyback him, kind of like they did with uh Tiger and McIntyre last year so um I, I don't know it's 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 very interesting there's a lot of a lot of a lot more questions than you'd probably hope to have with two weekends left in the regular season yeah I think that's probably the most likely scenario where Wood just kind of continues to be this first guy out of the bullpen uh relieving either Tiger or Molina and you know I, I and I really don't think he sh I don't think he's I don't think Gage has done enough to be a weekend starter. I, I'll just I'll be honest with that. I mean, you look at his performance this Saturday. He was great. And then he gave up three runs at the very end. You know, like if you're going to be a starter, you have like your your value is in pitching more than, you know, three, four innings. I don't know if can has Gage would proven he can do that against an SEC lineup. No, he hasn't. It was a great, you know, a good performance against Missouri State, but even that was a short start. Like, I like when, when it's a, it's a lot different being a starter and being a reliever, just in terms of mindset. You know, like a reliever, you can go out and th like, hey, I kind of want to eat up four innings, but if I only get to two and it's scoreless, I did I did my job, right? Like, I but with a with a starter, like if you only go throw two innings, unless it's like known a bullpen game, that's you're not you haven't done your job, so. I, I really don't think Gage has passed either of those two guys yet. Now the frustrations are there and maybe as we keep going, he could, but man, it's getting super late <laughs> right now. There's only two regular season series left and you're playing against a top 15 team in Mississippi state and then a top five team in Texas A&M. And then you got the sec tournament and then it's the regionals, which, you know, I mean, I guess you, I guess, you know, Dave can still kind of make the argument, well, I'm building up for the regionals. That's when I want to have my team. But, you know, if they lose two more series here, they could knock themselves out of being a national seed, which is crazy to think about and have to go on the road for a super regional. But I, I think these these next two series are so important that, you know, I'm, they're not going to risk injury. They're not going to do anything completely crazy, but they are they, they need to treat these as if, you know, this is must win series territory, I think. And I don't know if I would, I don't know if it's just the right time. It feels a little late to thrust a guy like Gage Wood into that 
Sunday SEC starter. It's a rubber match. I mean, four and a third innings and three runs, like it's great for Gage, but in the grand scheme of things, like that's not that, you know, great of appearance when you just look at the box score only. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. But I mean, it, it really, that should be good for a Sunday. Like in the SEC, look at, look across the league. That should be good for a Sunday if your offense is producing. And I'm, we'll dive into that here in a minute, I'm sure. <laughs> but that, that's what, that's what Arkansas is struggling with. Uh, so it, 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 I don't know. It, it'll be interesting. You know, I'll, I will say this, you know, it feels like the next two series are must win or whatever, but Arkansas has already got 17 SEC wins. They're still a top. I think they're number three in the RPI right now. Honestly, I think they could, if they just win one game in each of the next two series, I think they've sit, clinched up a top eight seed. Hmm. I, I really do. Uh, just historically speaking, 19 SEC wins, uh, a top, you know, they'd still be top 10 RPI for sure. That is a, that's top eight seed. So, or even if they win two out of three against Mississippi State, you know, at home, and then they get swept at A&M, you're, you're a top 10 team, or a top eight national seed at that point, and uh, you get the home field advantage. But uh, I, I think they could lose out, and they'll still be a top 16 seed, uh, be a, you know, Nash, uh, where they get to host at least a regional. I think that's pretty much clinched. Uh, but I think they're two wins away from, for sure, being a top eight seed. Just interesting. I think they, I think they put themselves at risk if they lose this home series to Mississippi State, where then you go to College Station, you got to win a game, and then you go to the SEC tournament, and I know it doesn't really mean much, and I think the track record has shown that like the, the NCAA doesn't put too much stock in that in terms of like adjusting the higher teams and everything. But you put yourself at risk if you if you lose this series to Mississippi State and then you go get swept by Texas A and M. Uh, then, then it's, it's nerve wracking time. I think you're going to be that an eight or a seven seed, you know, but I, I understand their track record and what they've accomplished already this year. It puts them in a really great spot where they don't have to stress too much about, it feels like they're going to get a home regional and super regional. So, and it's honestly kind of crazy. We're even having this discussion right now. Uh, they just went on the road and lost, you know, two games to a top 10 team in the sec. The sky is not falling. But there are some performances that I th the concern levels are, I think, I, are a little raised higher for at least us in the media more than they have been this year. Um, I was kind of surprised how, how calm Dave was in his press conference on um, Sunday night. He definitely, I felt, was a little more calm about this than their last series loss when they went on the road and, and lost to uh, Alabama, I think. But we'll see. Uh, let's talk about the offense and let's, let's segue into that talk. Uh, Hutch, I texted you last night. Let's each go through our, uh, our preferred Arkansas starting nine. Let's pretend it's a righty on the Hill. And if you want, you can kind of go give me your changes of what it would be if it was a lefty. I personally don't have any changes. Like these are the nine guys. I think I would start. Give me, let's roll through your, what would your batting lineup be? It's game three. The College World Series is on the line in Omaha right now. Who are you starting um, at, at the plate, the starting nine, and where they're playing in the in the field? So I think the first part of this is is relatively easy. I mean, you got Stovall leading off, hitting play in second base. I think that's pretty pretty easy. The next three are kind of interchangeable depending on what you want to do in terms of matchups. I like to go left, right, left, right as much as I possibly can. I know Dave likes to do that as well. So I went with uh, Sprague Lott hitting second, uh, playing third base. I got McLaughlin hitting third, uh, playing first, and Vajeva Aloy uh, batting cleanup and playing shortstop. I think those those four guys are pretty pretty set. Uh, maybe Kendall Diggs can work his way back in there based on, you know, we, we, we did see him get kind of going this weekend. I've got him batting fifth and playing right field. Then I've got Peyton Holt batting sixth, and I've got him starting in center. I just think that's the best option right now. Uh, then I've got Hudson White, who, again, showed some li uh, life this weekend. Uh, batting, I guess that's, what, through sit, uh, seventh and catching. Then his last two spots are the ones I struggled with the most. Uh, I've got in the eight hole, I've got the DH. Uh, I've got question marks written down here. So I've got several <laughs> different options here, but I'll go ahead and tell you, at batting ninth, I'm going to go ahead and put Will Edmondson in left. I know he didn't play, he didn't do anything at the plate uh, on Sunday, uh, but he's 
a better glove and a decent bat or better bat, I guess. I mean, Ross Lovich is probably the best bat out of the group, but he's made a couple of plays in the outfield that just make me shake my head. Like that's, that's a play an SEC outfielder should be able to make. Uh, so, and then also, you know, I guess the other candidate out there would be maybe Jason Jones, but we haven't seen him hardly at all in SEC play. I just think he's, He's got all the talent in the world, but he just hasn't put it all together. You know, he when he hits the ball, he hits it hard, but haven't seen enough to make him uh, my left fielder. And I guess the other option you could do is put Holt in left field and Wilmsmeyer in center. I just I don't think that's your best option right now because he doesn't bring anything to the plate. I'd rather have uh, uh, Wilmsmeyer on the bench as a pinch runner whenever you absolutely need a run or a defensive replacement, maybe you put him in center field the last you know, eighth and ninth inning when he's not going to have to hit. Uh, then you can move Holt over to left, and you got a, probably your best defensive alignment there. The DH, I do think, depends on right-handed or left-handed pitcher on the mound. I, I, I went ahead and crunched the numbers. I got them all right here. You know, Nolan Souza is, I think, the guy that I think a lot of fans are like, okay, he's got to be the guy. I saw some people on Twitter saying it was criminal that he wasn't the starting DH uh, on, uh, I guess it was Sunday. And the reality is, is he's hitting 185 against lefties and almost 300 against righties. So you can only play him against righties, I think. You know, he's he just, you can't start him against the lefty. So that kind of, you know, deter- if, if it's a right-hander, I'd probably go with Souza. Uh, he's probably the better option right there. You know, Lovich, if he's not playing in the field, I think he's too much of a liability defensively. Maybe you give him a look at DH. Uh, he he does have kind of the better you know, overall numbers from these guys. Uh, so that's that's a guy you consider. And then if you need a right-handed bat, you know, to to maybe give you you know start against the lefty, I think Helfrich is an option. He just hasn't really gotten that many options. Wagner, I think maybe as well. Uh, the other thing I'll say about Wagner is I'm curious. You know he. He was a, he's a first baseman. You know, he's probably the backup first baseman behind McLaughlin. And he played first base last year at Tarleton State. But before that, he was a corner outfielder at Kansas. I wonder if they would experiment maybe moving him out there to give them mm. another option at left field, get another bat in the lineup. Um, that may be something I asked about uh, at Swatters Club today with DDH. But I think I'll probably, you know, just if, if we're assuming a right-hander's on the mound, I'll probably do Souza with Lovich also getting maybe some consideration there. That's that's who I'm hitting the eighth and, and starting at DH. We we, uh, we agree a lot of, you know, I, there, there's only two spots that are up for grabs. Um, and that's, well, there's the two outfielder spots and the, and the designated hitter. And Peyton Holt is 100% starting in one of the outfield spots. So um, what I what I struggle with a lot is, when I was going through this exercise was Dave Van Horn has consistently said, we're going to, we're beating teams with pitching and defense and he wants the lineup to be better, but like, that's the strength of this team. So what I don't really understand is why, you know, why do you not play into that strength? And for, so with that said, let's, uh, let's go through my lineup. I would have Stovall hitting first, of course, and I'm also going to go lefty righty Stovall hitting first and playing second. Um, and again, and, this is a radical change and this is my lineup. This is not a prediction of Dave Van Horn, but I do think that this is, I think I, I want to see Peyton Holt hitting second and playing. I would have him in left field hitting second. He's hitting over 300. I think, you know, Sprague lot has been really good. This isn't a demotion for him. This is, I think spray. I, when there's runners on base, I, for whatever reason, I just have more trust in Sprague lot than Peyton Holt right now. And Peyton Holt has been good at, you know, he's had some huge moments this season with some home runs, but I just, I, I think I want Sprague lot hitting a little bit further down in the order with some more RBI opportunities. And I think if you get Stovall and Holt up there at the top, that's, you know, two great table setters that can get on base for the rest of the guys. So Stovall leading off, Holt hitting second, playing left, uh, McLaughlin hitting third, playing first, the Heva Alloy uh, hitting fourth and playing shortstop. I'm going to separate from the lefty righty here because I think Kendall Diggs is slumping that poorly. So I'm going to have uh, Jared Sprague lot hitting fifth, Kendall Diggs hitting sixth, uh, playing right field, Sprague lot playing third, Hudson White hitting seventh and catching, 
And then hitting eighth for me at DH is going to be Nolan Souza. I just think I, I can see the argument against lefties he can't hit, but really it's not like anybody is tearing up lefties right now, like any of those righties either. Um, I really debated this though between Souza and Helfrick. And one reason why is if you look at, you know, Helfrick recently, he had a huge slump uh, early in the season that carried over to the beginning of the SEC. But, you know, in his last five starts, he has scored a run in every single game. Now, one of those was against UAPB and another one was against Missouri State, but against Kentucky and then twice against Florida, he's he scored a run. You know, he had a huge home run against Florida. Like, he's get, still getting on base and finding a way to cross home plate. At the end of the day, that's super important. I still think Sousa has proven more than Helfrick over the course of the year. That's why I give him the nod at the eight hole and DH. And then ninth, I've got Ty Wilmsmeyer. I honestly think it's kind of crazy that we've, that he's, he only played one game this series. Um, I know he's not hitting well, but neither is Will Edmondson really, neither is Ross Lovich really. And you saw so many outfield miscues this weekend. I think, you know, pitching and defense, the defense is is worse without Ty Wilmsmeyer in the game. It's it's significantly better. He covers so much ground for Kendall Diggs and Wright. I mean, I'm, I joke with you all the time in the Bomb Walker press box that Kendall Diggs is a right foul line fielder. Like that's kind of his his territory is the right foul line, and Ty Wilmsmeyer has the right center gap locked down. Um, so I don't know. I know he's struggling, but I I saw I put some stat out on Twitter last night and. I, it's hard to believe. I don't really think it makes sense. It's kind of just a base, a weird baseball is weird stat, but in the sec, Arkansas is 15 and three with Ty Wilmsmeyer in the lineup. And they're now two and four when he sits and yes, he is hitting 186 on the season. So it doesn't really make much sense. Uh, he's just got that winning juju about him, but I do think there's something to be said for his fielding. And if he's in the lineup against Kentucky in both of those games, I think he makes the plays in center that Peyton Holt doesn't on Sunday, you know, that line drive that hit the glove and bounced off and the the ground ball that allowed to run the store. And I think Peyton Holt might make the play in left field on Saturday that Ross Lovich doesn't. So uh, that's my lineup. I think it's, it, I, I don't expect Peyton Holt to move up. I think, you know, Spraglot has hit well out of the second spot. He's going to stay there and Peyton Holt will move down there, but it's just kind of crazy that we're here. It's May. It's the regionals are a few weeks away and we still have at least three real questions about this Arkansas lineup. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this. I love that you put Holt up in the two hole just because that's kind of what I wanted. And I was thinking like <laughs> before the season, like I, I was like, I would love to have Peyton Holt up there. Cause I like the table setter aspect of it. Like you said, and I, I, I love that. I, I, I kind of want to steal that from my lineup. Um, but I, I think what I, I think my problem was I was trying to also get in the mind of DVH and yeah. kind of how he would do it. And I think he's kind of settled on those top four guys that I had in my lineup with Stovall, JSL, McLaughlin, and Alloy. I think that's pretty much kind of how DVH is. But I, I love Holt up there in the two hole. I will say that. And I also think, you know, you might be onto something with the whole, you know, lean into the defense thing. It, it's weird because that's what DVH typically has done. You know, historically speaking, just last year, he had John Bolton, who was hitting about 186 or whatever Wilmsmeyer's hitting as your starting shortstop. And it's not like you had a ton of better options. You did have a, a better offensive option, but it's not like it was so much better that it outweighed the defense. And, you know, John Bolton was a very good defensive shortstop, especially late in the year. He was really good. Um, and I think, you know, Wilmsmeyer has proven that he is a very good defensive center fielder. He's definitely got the speed to cover the ground. He, he reads the ball well, has made some pretty spectacular catches. Um, so I could see them doing that, you know, especially whenever you, as you said, Edmondson and then Lovich, they're not like, that much better than him offensively to where it outweighs that. So I I could I could see them doing that. And that, that 15 and 3 stat, that's not something I realized until you mentioned it. That's I think there is something there. You know, it's 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 not, you know, perfect. You know, it's kind of like, you know, pitching wins and losses. You know, it's it's not it's not perfect, but uh, I think there maybe is something to be said there uh, with with that. So It'll be interesting to see what Dave, Dave Van Horn decides to do these last couple of weekends. 
For sure. And I will say getting past the, even though that stat that I read and just kind of the stats of, you know, those out that, that battle for center field with Lovich Edmondson and Wilmsmeyer. Yes. Ty Wilmsmeyer struggles are contributing to the Arkansas lineup struggles, but he's not like shouldering. I think a big part of the blame when you think about, okay, why is this lineup maybe not living up to its expectations? It's, it's Kendall Diggs. It's, you know, Mahiva Aloy who, is hitting fine. Like, I don't think any Arkansas fan is complaining much about the Heva, but he's still, you know, only hitting 266 and he leads the team, but he only has 11 home runs. I think we thought that number would be closer to 20 when the season began. You know, he's only slugging 468. I thought that number would be in the 500s for sure. Um, it's it's the it's that it's that core at the top of the lineup other than Peyton Stovall and Ben McLaughlin. They just haven't quite gotten it yet. And I think as we've kind of gone through this exercise, one thing that Dave might have left up his sleeve is some is reverting to something he had at the beginning of the year and moving Hudson White further up the lineup. You know, I mean he's hitting two sixty five now. That's just one point behind the Heva Aloy. And I know batting average is, you know, not the end all be all, but he was really struggling, you know, in, in earlier this SEC campaign. He had a great weekend against Kentucky, was one of the few bats to have a great weekend. Maybe he goes to the two hole, you know, and then you keep Peyton Holt down, you know, where he is as kind of a spark plug, you might say, at the bottom of the lineup. And and then you get Jared Spraglot into more RBI driving position. But I think you're right. I think Dave is happy with it's hard to move a guy like JSL who's exceeding all expectations out of where he's had success so far this year. Yeah, I think so. I, I think it was good to see just White have a good productive weekend. I think I, I looked it up. Uh, Stovall and White uh, went a combined 12 for 25 against Kentucky. Uh, wow. So they hit just a hair under 500. Uh, the rest of the lineup went uh, 14 for 80 which was about 175. So Man. Uh, th- those two guys are, are hitting well. Uh, I think if you're Arkansas, your hope is, okay, those guys have got it going. They just need to keep going. Maybe you get a couple of guys hot this weekend against Mississippi State where you add, you know, maybe maybe McLaughlin gets hot and, and Aloy gets hot. And then the weekend after that, maybe another couple of guys get hot. And then by the time the, se- the postseason gets here, maybe they're all clicking. And, again, we've discussed this before. Even when they're all clicking, this isn't going to be, you know, the 27 Yankees, okay? I mean, it, it's, it's just not good. That's not the case. But they can be above average. And if they're above average with this pitching staff, assuming they get it all figured out with the rotation and everything, they still have all the pieces to be a national title contending team. We just got to see it all happen. It's all got to come together at the right time. And will that happen we're not going to know that until the postseason gets here. Very true. Uh, last thing I'll say about this this weekend in particular, I thought it was interesting seeing the outfield struggle at a defensively in a huge ballpark. Um, Kentucky's got deep, deep outfield walls. Uh, that's something to keep in mind if this team does make it to Omaha. And uh, TD Ameritrade, is that what it's called still? Uh, ballpark? Uh, it's Charles that. Schwab Field, I think. Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab Field. If, if they get to Omaha, that place is uh, probably the biggest college baseball park in America. Uh, just something to monitor with the, the outfield defense. It'll become even more important when you get there. So, uh, I think that's I think that's a good stopping point for baseball. Um, big, big series this weekend against Mississippi State. You know, the Bulldogs are playing excellent. Um, they won their series this weekend. They are surging into the top 15 Arkansas, a little, you know, a little, uh, a little punched in the mouth right now, coming off the Kentucky series, coming back home, uh, just for vibes purposes. I, I think it's not, it's not a must win, but they would really like to win this series. You know, it's not, nothing's going to be must win anymore until we get to Omaha, uh, and the stakes get ra- or until we get to the regionals and the stakes get ratcheted up like that. But for vibes per- purposes, I think everybody in this program, from the coaching to the players to the fans, would really like to see a bounce back performance and a series victory here to to get the ship righted before Texas A and M. So, with all that said, Hutch, uh, basketball. John Calipari got, in my opinion, his two biggest commits of the off season so far. 
uh, last week, uh, Jonas Idu from Tennessee, the six foot 10, six foot 11 big 11. man, a uh, six foot 11 big man, uh, was first team all SEC last year, um, committed to Arkansas and gives them a foundation on defense and a skilled center on offense who can, you know, he's got some decent touch around the rim. He can run the, be a rim runner uh, in the pick and roll game. Excellent pickup. And then he one-upped himself by getting John L. Davis from Florida Atlantic later in the week, uh, the star guard on the FAU team that made the final four a couple seasons ago. I mean, these, these guys, these are the two pillars of the, of the program right now, right? Like maybe not moving forward. Cause I, I bet they're only here for one year each. Um, I think they only have, might only have one year of eligibility each, but when we talk about the 2024, 2025 Razorbacks, I mean, those are the two starting points, the two best players, and hopefully uh, the two guys that are going to lead this team to a, a much better season than we experienced last winter. Yeah, these are huge pickups, just also in the sense that it shows that, that Coach Cal can go out and get elite transfer portal guys, that he's you know not just going to rely on getting all these high school talent, but she's he's gotten that. I mean, he's got you know the the three five star uh, recruits that, that they they've landed. That he's you know flipped from Kentucky. Uh, you know he got the the big man uh, from Croatia to to follow him from Kentucky. But all those guys are the kind of guys he already had. These are guys that he specifically went out to recruit to Arkansas, and, and he got them. And and I think we we know what what uh, is it is it I do or is it a do? Is that hey I, I don't I don't know. But but to get we we've seen how good he is because he he I think he put like a what like twenty four and twelve or something like that against Arkansas at Bud Walton Arena uh, this year for Tennessee uh, so we know what he can do and you know John L Davis he's just a guy that's that's improved every year in college and he made a big jump from you know the previous season to this past season uh, you know from the Final Four team to this team. And that's despite I'm pretty sure FAU returned most of its team from that uh, that final four run, and so like he's still even with all those guys coming back, he made a big jump. They made the jump from Conference USA to the American, so it's not like he's new to this whole jumping up to the SEC thing. Like yes, the SEC is a different level, but he has gone up a level in the past and 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 performed very very well. So and plus look at his three point shooting, every year it's gotten a little bit better. Now, I'm not going to say he's going to improve from 41% to, at, at Arkansas, uh, but if he can just even shoot close to that, you know, 38, 39%, that, that's going to be huge for Arkansas. I think his three-point shooting numbers are going to depend a lot on how Calipari fills out the rest of the roster because right now I was considered – I. Uh, it is a do after a quick Google search. Apparent, uh, Tennessee says it's a y do, so a do. Uh, but – as of right now, with the guys that they've got, I mean, I think John L. Davis is going to have a lot of point guard responsibilities. He might not be the point guard, but with the guys that they've got right now, he's going to—he's the most experienced ball handler. He, you know, his assist numbers went up in every year at Florida Atlantic. Uh, he's going to be the fulcrum of the offense, and I, I think if that's the case, his number will go. His three-point shooting number will go down um, more. You know, off the dribble threes, but if they go get a point guard and he can kind of be more off the ball at times and everything, I think that number, you know, it could stay right there, but who knows? We, you know, we thought Jeremiah Davenport and call battle would be snipers from three and gosh, they just, they, they plummeted. Uh, congratulations to KB, by the way, committing to Gonzaga. That's a, that's a huge, you know, it's not a, it, it's, it's kind of a step up from Arkansas. It's not, not a significant one, but I mean, he's, in the national spotlight next year for sure. And uh, Gonzaga is going to be in the tournament. You know, they always are. And uh, Mark Few is a great coach. Anyways, uh, I think, again, I think the, the rest of the roster is now, you know, I think Calipari's got his stars. And, you know, I saw some talk uh, amongst Arkansas fans that once they got a do, they were like, oh, well, now we're going to get Brandon Garrison and maybe we can get Norchad O'Meer. And I just, the whole time I was just like, I mean, that would be that'd be great for the Hogs, but I don't see all those guys sharing a front court, especially with, I think some Arkansas fans are underselling Z Zvonimir Ivicic. I think he is, like, I, I think they could go out and get someone, another big guy, but I think right now, like, 
Cal is probably planning on him being a starter. Like he was a high recruit. He's got all the talent in the world. His game really fits well, nicely with Adu, where he can kind of stretch the floor and, and Adu can be the more interior presence. Um, it would be hard to fit more stars in the front court, but they definitely need a point guard. They need some more guards, experienced guys. Uh, what do you think is the biggest need remaining on the roster? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I would like to see them. I, I mean, you mentioned earlier, you know, maybe finding another point guard. Um, I know Boogie Fland is is supposed to be this phenomenal, you know, McDonald's All American, I think, or you know, five star recruit. Um, I think he's he's really really good. Um, but can he handle all that as a true freshman? We saw Anthony Black, you know, a couple of years ago was this highly highly talented. You know, he was a lottery pick. I think he went like seventh or eighth overall to the Magic, you know, after one year at Arkansas. He was phenomenal. But even he had those freshman moments where it's like, okay, yeah, that was that was definitely a freshman point guard. I would love to see them add like a veteran point guard, even if he's not the guy, like the primary guy, even if Boogie Flynn is like the star. Um, and even if John L. Davis ends up handling more point guard duties than he's used to, I would like to see a veteran point guard kind of guy added but both to help on the court and then also maybe to help off the court, help develop those guys. So I, I would like to see maybe that added. Uh, I think they could use another big man. You're probably not going to land a Brandon Garrison, you know, that that's of that caliber. But if you're, if you are going to be playing, like you were saying, you know, uh, uh, Adu and, and a uh together, you probably need some other, you, know, you need some more size. You need some, some guys that can come off the bench. If, if one of those guys gets in foul trouble or just to give them a blow, uh, those those guys probably aren't going to be playing 35 minutes a game, uh, so I, I think that would be another uh, ad that they should they should go after. But again, you know they're only at six scholarships, so really, what what do they need? They need everything still. <laughs> Definitely, I think the biggest question that I have for this team, uh, for how this roster is going to get constructed at the end, is are we going to is are Davis and Fland both? I think Davis and Fland are both going to be starters and and maybe I'm wrong on this, but like, as I, as I look at it right now, I think that they're both going to be starters is the third starter in the backcourt with those guys, a point guard, or is it a Carter Knox or Billy Richmond? And I mean, those guys can are kind of tweeners. They can go front court back court, but I think that's kind of like where I'm wondering what is Calipari going to do? Is he going to play two of the freshmen and, you know, not have that true true point guard, or will he? But where will some of the freshmen come off the bench? You know, will Richmond and Carter Knox come off the bench, and you'll have a very experienced group with those two leading kind of you know, the the second unit. I could see either way working out. Honestly, I mean, if if Car- Carter Knox looks like a pro already, <laughs> you know, he's got the size and the strength and the, his finishing ability, like. I could see it working out with him as a starter alongside Fland and Davis and then Adu and, and if Sitch are another big, I mean, maybe, maybe you start the three freshmen, you know, and if Sitch comes off the bench, I think Billy Richmond and Carter Knox could both spend time at the four against a lot of lineups. Um, you know, you won't be able to do that if a team is starting two true bigs, but Anyways, I, I think that that's kind of where I'm wondering if Cal is going to, if his next, if his, the rest of his roster kind of lends him more towards, we're going to play a little smaller and have a true veteran point guard, like you said, or maybe we're just going to kind of go big, let these freshmen kind of play and kind of dominate people with, with size and athleticism. And that's, that's been something that he did a lot at Kentucky. I could see him maybe leaning that way, especially given right now, like there aren't that many elite elite point guards left in the portal uh where where does he go to try and get that veteran point guard is is uh i guess a question if that is the route he decides yeah exactly and i think the other thing important that's important for fans to remember now is that uh you're gonna have to be patient a little bit you know i know the several a lot of the guys that that are left like in the portal like top guys they're also testing the nba draft waters we saw the the NBA draft combine list come out, the G League combine list come out. Uh, important to note that uh, I saw where uh, John L. Davis was invited to the G League uh, uh, combine, but I guess has declined it. Uh, so you can pretty much count him coming to Arkansas. That's, that's great news uh, for the Hogs. But I know there's several guys that are in the portal 
also while also testing the, the waters, uh, we're gonna have to wait on those guys. I think the the deadline I want to say is the May 29th uh, is is the the deadline to withdraw from the draft and maintain your college eligibility. Uh, and then also, I think I read I want to say the Hogbeat guys uh, had this that the summer session starts on May 28th. So almost at the same time, you, you'd like to think guys would get you know on board by then so they can be here on campus by then. Uh, so maybe those are those are a couple of dates to keep in mind. And here we are recording on May 6th. That's still a, a, a few weeks away. So we're going to have to, I know Arkansas fans struggle with this sometimes, but you're going to have to have some patience. And not even patience. Like, I think that there has to be, I think Arkansas fans might need a little acceptance that this like Monstars type of roster that they were expecting is not going to come to fruition. And they've already got a super talented roster. You've got a guy that SEC first team last year in ADU, you got a guy who's going to be a, you know, a betting, he'll be up there with the favorites, I feel like, in the, the betting markets for the SEC player of the year in John L. Davis. I mean, he's that good. He was the number one or two transfer by everybody's ranking um, in the portal. He's one of the best players in America. He's got experience being the leading scorer on a Final Four run. I mean, that's that's terrific. And then you've got three McDonald's All-American freshmen coming in. And then you got a guy from Croatia who Calipari was so high on. He wanted to kind of like rush his eligibility and, and you know, kind of go not toe to toe, but kind of deal with the whole loopholes and everything from the NCAA and get him eligible for the SEC last year. I mean, like that this those these six guys, I feel like are the core. And, you know, it's it's college basketball recruiting, the era of NIL. A surprise could happen. Arkansas could drop a bag for another star and he could come to Fayetteville and we could have, you know, the, the, these monsters could be forming that I just kind of dismissed. But I think these six are the core of the rotation next year. And from here on out, we're going to be adding complementary pieces. And maybe if, if something comes up, a, a star. Do you think that there's like a big fish still waiting to be caught for Arkansas or are, are these the top six guys? I think this is pretty much the top six. I could see them adding a guy or two that maybe cracks this top six and bumps a couple of guys down. You know, I, I, I'm not sure how deep Calipari's kind of playing on going. I'm, it's kind of weird for me because I've got to readjust my like my brain and thinking like, yo, Mus wanted six or seven guys and no more than that, you know, to play. You know, I think Cal's going to be a little bit more different. I think he's going to rotate some guys, but I also don't know if it's going to be the full – Mike Anderson, we're going 12 guys deep, and all of them are going to get good, big playing time. Um, so I, I'm still kind of adjusting that in my head. Um, but, yeah, I think that there's some there's some good quality players out there. You know, I've seen, you know, I know Jackson Robinson is in the portal. I know a lot of Arkansas fans would love to see him come back to Arkansas. Uh, but you're also going to have to beat out his former coach that's now at Kentucky, you know, and Coach and, and, and Pope. So, uh, I, I think that's that's going to be you know, something to watch. You know, he's he's one. There, I know there's some other guys that are out there, but I think they're mostly, as you were saying, going to be more complementary type pieces. A perfect example, I think, of a complementary type piece that's really valuable is Adu Fierro, and I might have butchered that name too, but from Kentucky, I, I think he was on a visit to Arkansas this past weekend or recently. Uh, very athletic, defensive-minded swing guy, still working on the off. Like that's that's the that that's a perfect addition, right? Like a guy that's not going to come in and demand ten shots a game. He's happy being that you know defensive guy that's not going to have the ball in his hands too much on offense, but he can provide a, a spark at the other end through offensive rebounding or transition stuff like that. I think uh, those are the type of guys that are left to fill out this roster. And when if they do get a few more of guys like Adu Fierro and a point guard, it's going to be a top 15, top 20 preseason team in the country. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mean, they've got, is there an SEC team with a better one-two punch than Davis and Adu? I guess maybe Alabama if Sears comes back, right? Um, Johnny Broom came back for Auburn. So potentially Auburn has that too. Um, but you can make an argument Arkansas has got the best one, two punch in the league and it wouldn't be a crazy argument. So uh, I think we can wrap up there, Hutch, almost an hour. We uh, a couple minutes longer than we normally do, but had a lot to discuss. Um, I would like to stress we had a lot of depressing stuff to talk about on the baseball team today. I don't think the sky is falling. Let's close here. Do you like, I think 
I think this team still can win a national championship, but things have to change at the plate, at least for me. Um, what's what's just your overall you know outlook right now for the baseball team with just two series left on the regular season? It's still a damn good team. They're still a top five team. They're still competing for the SEC West. Even if they don't win, even if A&M edges them at the very end, it's not the end of the world. They're still going to have a, a great opportunity to make a run in the postseason. You've still got Dave Van Horn running the ship. He knows what he's doing. Even though he makes some decisions that every once in a while makes you scratch your head, most of the time they work out. There's a reason he's a legend. So I think they're going to be okay. They have the pieces to win a national championship. Am I as confident as I was earlier in the season? Maybe not. But again, it's important to remember that Arkansas is showing cracks and flaws. So are other teams. And it's just that <laughs> Arkansas's cracks and flaws are not near as severe as some other teams. I think that's really that perspective is important for fans because they usually only follow their team and not the rest of the league, the rest of the country. Texas A&M lost two of three games to LSU this weekend, who Arkansas swept pretty convincingly too. Like I'm not, it was, there were some close games, but it never really felt like Arkansas was going to lose that series at all, and they ended up getting a sweep. So, those, they're, they're, those are the uh, outside of the uh, Arkansas cracks uh, that you mentioned. So, awesome, everybody! Thank you so much for enjoying uh, for listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we will be back next Monday recapping Mississippi State and providing a probable preview for an SEC West title determination between Arkansas and Texas A&M in College Station. Uh, kind of a bummer both those teams slipped and fell a little this week because it's not. it probably won't be number one versus number two, but it's still going to be probably the highlight of the entire college baseball season when those two teams get together in College Station. So thank you so much, Hutch. Good to see you. I will see you in person in a couple hours at the Swatters Club and everybody else have a great rest of your week. Thanks for listening to Hog in the Mic.